thank you so much. Uh, our next speaker comes from across the ocean from the previous speakers. Uh, Professor Jacob Rowbottom uh, is a fellow uh, of University College Oxford as, uh, and an associate professor of law at the Faculty of Law at uh, the University of Oxford. Uh, Jacob has, uh, is a qualified barrister, in case you need someone there. Uh, he writes extensively on a, a range of topics, including the funding of political parties, which is a matter of power, which is not unrelated, media regulation, speech on the internet, and much more. So, Jacob, please. Okay, thank you for the introduction there. And um, we just had a fascinating talk, which was just explaining about how cybersecurity goes to basic issues of personal safety. I'm afraid in my presentation I'm going to go narrow in and focus in on some of the more traditional issues about the relationship between freedom of expression and privacy and the impact that digital surveillance has on the relationship between those two rights. Now I come, come at this from a background as a lawyer specialising in freedom of expression and media freedom. And typically, we've tended to see privacy and freedom of expression as being in opposition to one another. We see privacy as a restriction on freedom of expression. And that largely comes about by the way these issues have arisen in the United Kingdom. Normally what happens in the UK when we look at privacy and free speech, it concerns a newspaper that wants to publish uh, details about a celebrity's private life, and the, the celebrity then tries to restrict that publication, and then we see privacy as a restriction on free speech or media freedom. But that's just one particular aspect of the relationship between privacy and freedom of expression. You know, more uh, in many contexts, we can argue that privacy and freedom of expression are mutually supportive of one another. And by that I mean before we actually speak, before we actually write anything or say things to other people, we sometimes need privacy to develop our thoughts, maybe to have private discussions, to gather information, and so on. Okay, so the two can be mutually supportive. And this connection between the two, this is nothing new. Over 250 years ago, there's a famous case called Entic Encounter, and I say famous, maybe famous only to UK legal scholars, but nonetheless well known. Famous case called Entic Encounter, and that concerned about the power of the government to raid a journalist's home, seize their papers, go through their belongings. And in this landmark judgment, Lord Camden said, a person's papers are amongst their dearest property. And by that, what he was getting at is this idea that your personal papers are special. They're not just like other property because they somehow reflect your freedom of mind. It's what you do before you speak and to what you do to develop your ideas. You need your privacy protecting. And my argument would say that, I mean, that's always been around. That connection between privacy, free speech, that's nothing new. But I think in an era of digital surveillance, that aspect of the relationship becomes increasingly more important. And what I'll argue is that when we look at free speech, we're not just looking at the actual moment of communication, we're looking at other stages in the communication process, both the gathering of information and also the reading of information as well. So we don't just look at the moment of publication. This issue of digital surveillance has become incredibly topical in the United Kingdom. Um, late last year, the UK government enacted a law called the Investigatory Powers Act. And Edward Snowden described this as the most extensive form of surveillance in any Western democracy, and he said it went beyond what was available in some authoritarian regimes. Now, you can debate that, but it is nonetheless a significant piece of legislation. It's quite a long and complex piece of legislation, so I'm not going to try and go through it all. I can't possibly do justice to it. But some of the main provisions are, it gives powers to the government to intercept communications and actually look at the content of communications. So, you know, things like emails, telephone messages, and so on. It also gives powers to government for, to do something called equipment interference. Now, equipment interference is a polite way of saying hacking into people's devices. So it's equipment interference as things like going into someone's mobile phone, going into their laptop, and using that as a device to eavesdrop on people's conversations. That power is probably going to become increasingly important as we see the growth of the Internet of Things, as people have smart TVs, uh, things like Amazon Alexa and so on. There are more devices that can be interfered with uh, to, to, to eavesdrop 
and listen to what you're saying. The third aspect as well is that the, the Act uh, requires, it gives the power to government to require telecommunications companies to retain communications data and allow certain public authorities to have access to that data. And it says that communications data can be retained for up to 12 months. Now, what do we mean by communications data? It's not the content of what people are saying to one another. It's the details and the circumstances of those communications. So we don't know what people are saying, but it's about a way of finding out who spoke to who, at what time they spoke to that person, through what medium they spoke to that person. And if we get all of that communications data, knowing the context of who's talking to who and when, we can get quite a big picture about a person's life and we can make certain assumptions about them. Now, obviously, for all of these powers, they can only be exercised for certain purposes. And, you know, the main ones are the obvious candidates, like for issues of national security, prevention and detection of crime, and also for economic well-being. But these are very, very broad powers of surveillance that have been granted. Yet, the enactment of this legislation hasn't caused a massive public outcry. And some people wonder, why has this not been such a big source of controversy? It has with certain civil liberties campaigners, but it hasn't really been in mainstream politics. And there are certain thoughts that we might have. First of all, you know, various digital companies have access to lots of our personal data, and there's an argument to say, if they can access this stuff to decide what adverts to show to us, shouldn't we let government access some of this data to actually prevent terrorism or prevent crime? That might be one argument. The other argument you might have for this legislation is this, look, in the digital era, surveillance is simply a fact of life. Edward Snowden showed that this stuff is going on, regardless of whether there's a legislative framework in place or not, and there's an argument to say, should we just not have this put in legislation, and at least if it's done in the open, it can be more transparent and subject to significant safeguards. So that's one of the things they've put into the Investigatory Powers Act. Um, so these powers, for example, the interception of communications and the hacking into devices, you need a, a warrant from a minister and there needs to be judicial oversight of that, that, that warrant as well. So there are some safeguards in place, but some people say these aren't sufficient. The warrants are, can be cast in very broad terms and some people question whether ju ju judicial oversight is sufficiently rigorous. So what are the criticisms of this system of surveillance? Well, first of all, three, three main points that we can make. The first relates to the utility of this system of surveillance. Um, some people say the government has grabbed for itself broader powers than are necessary. All of this level of surveillance just isn't needed to prevent crime or terrorism. They could simply have drafted the legislation in narrower terms. Closely related to that as well is this idea of, is it really, what's the utility of this level of surveillance given that they can harvest masses of data, but that's no good unless you actually have the resources and the people in place to actually process that data and have some interpretation of it. So people query whether or not these powers really are going to do that much to prevent crime or terrorist acts in any event. So that's the first quote, quote, query is that we might say, well, what's the utility of these surveillance powers? Are they really as helpful as government suggests they might be? The second criticism is an obvious one relating to people's privacy, um, to say, you know, these, this level of surveillance is a gross interference of privacy. And that has really been an issue post Edward Snowden. There have been some concerns about this. And as a result, in the Investigatory Powers Act, there is a clause there to say, you know, that privacy has to be protected. And, you know, when, when they're issuing warrants and there's judicial oversight of warrants, privacy rights have to be taken into account. But again, people who were, were wonder just how effective that type of safeguard might be. But my main concern, um, or the main point I wanted to make today, is it's not just about privacy. There are certainly some major free speech issues at stake uh, when we look at these powers of surveillance. And one area which was actually a topic of discussion when this statute was being enacted is that concerning the protection of journalist sources. Now, as you all know, before journalists uh, pr print information, they need to, in some cases, they need to rely on confidential sources and they don't want to disclose the identity of that source. If they do so, it creates a chilling effect. People might be afraid to come forward and inform the journalist. 
And traditionally what's happened is that if the government wants to find out who's been informing a journalist, they have to go to court and try and get an order for the journalist to disclose the identity of their source. Okay, so there's some safeguard there. But if you've got access to communications data, you don't need to find out. You don't even need to ask the journalist who their source was. You can just go to their telephone records, go to their internet history, and you can pretty much find out who they've been talking to, join the dots, and it'll quickly be apparent who's informing them. Now, that was an issue that the older powers of surveillance in the UK had been used to do that on a number of occasions, and that was taken to court, and it was found to be a violation of the right to freedom of expression. As a consequence of this, the Investigatory Powers Act says if the, access, if the purpose for accessing communications data or internet records is to discover who the identity of a journalist's source is, then there has to be some judicial approval of that access. So it provides a safeguard. So to have a temp, and we'll see how well that works once, once the act is fully implemented. But it goes to show that surveillance can impact not just the moment of publication, but the prior stages as well. The surveillance can be used to regulate the gathering of information that takes place prior to publication. But more broadly than that, because that's very specific kind of to media freedom and journalistic freedom, you've also got um, issues of you know, the impact of surveillance, surveillance on the rights of an audience. Um, you know, if you people know what into websites you're, what, what you're looking at, that can have an inhibiting effect. You know, some people might say, well, that's because if you're up to no good, you want to keep things private. But there are lots of good reasons why people might be wary of visiting certain websites, having certain conversations, speaking to certain people, if they think that information will become known to the authorities. They might also fear that there's certain adverse consequences that might arise. You know, that if you're visiting certain websites, you might find that you become a target for investigation or that you find yourself, you know, some way coming to the attention of the authorities. So that can have a chilling effect on people's reading habits, can make people more wary if they think they're going to be held accountable for what they read or what they look at. Now, I'm in the process of finishing a book on media law where I've been looking at various controls on freedom of expression. And one of the interesting things that I've found is that there are, we have a range of publication offences in the UK. Those are criminal offences or other types of offences that say you cannot publish certain types of content. And several decades ago, they might have been the primary control. But what I've seen is that in many areas, there is a declining reliance on the classic offences relating to publication. So obscenity law and so on, certain hate speech laws aren't as widely enforced as you might imagine. Now, one conclusion that we might have from that is that, you know, countries becoming a little bit more liberal, they're more tolerant of free speech. But I'm not sure that's the case. I think it's one where the nature of the controls on freedom of expression are starting to change. And there's some of them we've already referred to this morning. So things like the role of internet intermediaries. There's an increasing push in the UK for people to say they should have some monitoring role or that they should be proactive in blocking certain sites and taking it down. So that's not imposing any liability on the publisher. It's relying on the intermediary. In other cases, governments or other speakers might try to counter speech, not by censoring it, but by engaging in communications of their own. So rather than resorting, say, to the law of defamation that protects your reputation, you engage a reputation management company that will try and put out positive information with you. But I also think another piece of this jigsaw, one of the new controls, is that of government surveillance, watching what people are looking at, and so on. And that can create an environment that inhibits the free speech and inhibits people in choosing what they look at. So my central point is that in an era of widespread surveillance, free speech needs to emphasize not just the right to publish, not just the right to speak, but also the rights of the audience and the right to read and receive information as well. Thank you.